Today, this God-inspired achievement stands today as the link between the Buds of Promise and the Young Adult Missionary Society. And Ms. Zimmerman here is going to help me with my colors and motto and my watchword. Colors, navy blue. Colors, navy blue. Truth and loyalty. Truth and loyalty. Gold. Gold. Heaven. And honor. And honor. Motto. Motto. Ambassadors. Ambassadors. For Christ. For Christ. And watch word. Watch word. Christ for every youth. Christ for every youth. Every youth for Christ. Every youth for Christ. Thank you. Thank you, baby. You did a good job. Now we have a selection by the choir.
Amen. These young children have carried this morning's worship service. And as a church family, we should all be proud and giving God praise. Because whether they understand all of what they're doing, most of them and most times they're just emulating what they see us do until they come into a full understanding of what it is to worship God. And so you should be glad to God that they've seen something in all of us that would allow them to do the very things that we do Sunday after Sunday. And we give God the praise. To our pastor and our first lady, to members of the clergy, to our officers, members and visiting friends, to Sister Val and to these amazing young people who are members of this church. I greet you all in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. As you know, our pastor has told us that the fifth Sunday will be Youth Sunday. And so that is an opportunity for our young people to, to, to display to us and to God how much they love him and that they too can worship him in spirit and in truth. And so I just believe when uh, Brother Tyler and Sister Amber reached out to me that they saw a 25-year-old preacher. And that's why I was asked to stand before you this morning. I'm, that's what I'm telling myself to make me feel justified to stand here, and I'm going to stick with that. So I am just grateful for this opportunity, and I have a task this morning to speak to them while also speaking to us. So I ask that you pray with me and, and for me this morning as we go to the word of God. If you will turn with me to the book of Jeremiah, the first chapter. And I will read for you verses 4 through 8. Jeremiah, the first chapter, verses 4 through 8 from the New International Version. And the word of God reads, The word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. Alas, sovereign Lord, I said, I do not know how to speak. I am too young. But the Lord said to me, Do not say, I am too young. You must go to everyone I send you to and say whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you and will rescue you, declares the Lord. So this morning, just for a few short minutes, I'd like to preach from the subject, I was born for this. I was born for this. Bow your heads with me for a moment of prayer. Speak, Lord. For your servant is listening. Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening and wishes to obey. I ask now that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart, that it will be found acceptable in thine sight. For, O oh Lord, right now you are truly my strength and my redeemer. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. I was born for this. As a young person... It feels like you wait an enti your entire life just to do simple things. Younger children can't wait to become teenagers, and teenagers can't wait to become grown. To a young person, it feels like forever uh, before you can get your driver's license or apply for your first job. It, it feels like two eternities to, to even get your first Smartphone. I'm sure some of them will say amen in their spirits on that one this morning. And some households, I hear some claps, so I know I'm doing all right already. In some households, young girls must wait to wear makeup. Uh, 
parents will tell you that they've already decided in their minds on what the age should be for their sons and daughters to date. Daddies will tell you it's 40 for their daughters and mamas will tell you it's 45 for their sons. Young men must wait before using dad's tools or driving his car or his truck. And although the weight seems unfair to a young person, the weight is designed to ensure that the child is old enough and mature enough to handle certain responsibilities. Everyone considers the age of a young person, it appears, except God. Look at what Jesus said in Matthew and Luke. He says in Matthew, the 18th chapter and the third verse, Verily I say unto you, except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Luke, the 18th chapter and the 17th verse goes on to say, Whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little children, a little child shall in no wise enter therein. The Bible is full of young men and women who were minding their own business, young people, when God summons them to service. Although the call of God is never the same for everyone, there are some commonalities. First, their call is originated out of the Godhead. In other words, young people, God calls all people to serve him. God called Samuel while he was just a little boy. Daniel was a teenager when he stood his ground and refused to eat food that would defile his body. Daniel had friends who were also teenagers, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They were teenagers when they were thrown into the fiery furnace. Esther was no more than a teenager, young sisters, when she was summoned to go before the king to save an entire nation. Mary, even Mary, the mother of Jesus, was a teenager when God said, you will give birth to a baby boy and his name will be Emmanuel. David was the youngest of eight siblings and a teenager when he became a giant slayer. Jesus called 12 men to be with him and then sent them out to be disciples. And his disciples were no more than from a teenager to their early 20s. What I'm trying to say is age matters to everybody else except God. So the first commonality, young people, is that your call will always come from God. But then there's a second commonality, and that is that the biblical call seems impossible to complete. Everyone that God called or summons to do something was given an assignment that seemed impossible to complete. Build an ark, Noah, and there hadn't been any rain. Lead a nation out of Egypt, Moses. Face down a wicked king, Elijah. Preach to the Gentiles, Paul. Carry God's baby, Mary. Eat a scroll, Ezekiel. Go before the king, Esther. Take a handful of flour and a little oil in a jar to make a pancake for the prophet first widow. Go wash yourself in the Jordan, Naaman, so you can be healed of leprosy. I mean, every assignment that God gives his people will seem impossible to accomplish. But finally, God's call is not a want ad. God doesn't run ads for volunteers, young people. God knows exactly what he wants for the job that he wants done. There was only one Esther. There was only one John the baptizer. There was only one Moses, despite what Miriam and Aaron dared to think the day they asked, hasn't he also spoken through us? The truth of the matter is, young people, that God has selected you even at this age to be of service to him. Here in the text this morning, we find Jeremiah, the son of a prophet and high priest, Hilkiah. And Jeremiah is only 17 years old, hailing from a small town called 
Anatoth in the land of Benjamin. Jeremiah is a PK. He, he, he's like a, a Pastor Matthew's children. He's a preacher's kid. And no doubt Jeremiah has seen ministry from behind the scenes and thought that that's what my father was called to do. That's not for me. Very rarely do we get inside, an inside glimpse into one's calling. But as readers of the text this morning, we are eavesdropping on a conversation between Jeremiah and God. And there are four points that we can gather from this conversation. And once I give you those points, I'm going to be out of your way. There are four things that are needed when you are called by name. The first thing that we need is an identification. Verse 5 says, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. In other words, what God is saying to all of us this morning, Hollis Chapel, is, and he's saying it to Jeremiah, is that before you were a plus symbol in a pregnancy test, I already knew who you were. If you are asking yourself, why am I here? It's because the Lord wanted you to be here. The God we serve is intentional. He knew you would be here before your parents even realized they liked each other. And often we forget that we serve an omniscient God. God knows everything about everything. And that's why 20 chapters from chapter 1 in verse 11, we see the Lord say, For I know the plans I have for you, saith the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. The Lord wanted Jeremiah to know that he nor his calling was an afterthought. In fact, Paul bears witness to a similar experience in the book of Galatians when he says, but when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace to reveal his son in me that I might preach him among the heathens, immediately I conferred not with the flesh and blood. I know you had to say where you, where you would live, and I know you had to say uh, adults and where you would live and, and what you would drive. Young people, you may have had a say in what you got to eat for breakfast this morning, and maybe you had a say in, in what you could put on, but it had to be green and, and white, so maybe you didn't have much say. Sister Val took care of that for you. But all of us in some ways have had a say in what goes on in our lives. Here, though, we find that God knew he needed a prophet, and he, he had formed him in his mother's womb. He, he placed the characteristics that were needed inside of him. And so although we have a say in everything that we do in our lives, the truth is we never get a say in being called to work for God. We were all created to be called into some form of ministry, not to be necessarily a preacher, but to do things that will bring honor to God. So the first thing is identification. Say identification with me, young people. Identification. Thank you. The second thing that we can learn from the text is that there must be sanctification. Look with me in verse 5. Before you were born, I sanctified you. We often think of sanctification and justification as one and the same. But there is a difference because justification is God's declaration that the believer has a right standing before God based on the righteousness of Christ. While on the other hand, sanctification is an ongoing process of God pouring into you over and over again. To become holy is to become the kind of person God originally intended for all of us to be. Each day through sanctification, we're looking more and more like our heavenly father. Oh, when God calls your name, it's because he could see something in you that you could not see in yourself. When you speak for God, people should remark he or she sounds like their heavenly father. Not your earthly father, but your heavenly father. When you walk into a room, they should look at you and say, she walks, he walks like his heavenly father. When, when you give a word of encouragement, they should say, that sounds like something that will come from their heavenly father. 
1 Peter 1 and 16 says, Be ye holy, for I am holy. Now, I don't want us to mistake adults' sanctification with black skirts and white blouses. Because what I need you to understand is that these young people can be just as sanctified in a pair of jeans and a pair of chucks and a t-shirt that I can be in this robe and this stole. Because what we have to understand is that sanctification is a lifestyle. We've over the years mistaken sanctification with what we wear and what church we go to and what denomination we are a part of and whether or not we can do one thing or the other and what we don't do. But that's not real sanctification because real sanctification can speak a word from the Lord in a pair of shorts and a t-shirt. Real sanctification can put down a piece of prayer and a pair of bedroom shoes and a nightgown. Real sanctification is not what we wear. But it's what we have in our hearts. So the first one, young people, is identification. Say it with me, identification. identification. And the second one is sanctification. And the third one is ordination or consecration. Look with me in verse 5 again. I ordained you a prophet to the nations. Uh, Scorgy writes that consecration is the solemn action of setting something or someone apart for God's service. In the Old Testament, acts of, the con acts of consecration can be found in God's selection of Israel as his particular people of the priesthood to his service, of prophets who deliver his word, of a ritualistic objects for worship. And here God is telling Jeremiah that between the time he was conceived and the day he was born, he was set apart for God's service. I imagine that. But before your date of birth, you had already been set aside for God's service. While they were throwing your mom a baby shower, you were already set aside for God's purpose. Before your parents could even get the baby rooms ready, you were already set apart for God's service. I just need y'all to think about that. Before your parents even decided on your name, God already knew you and your name and that you would be set aside for God's service. Do you realize that there are certain traps that you didn't fall into adults simply because you were set apart before your birth? Do you understand, adult, that there's some people you never got entangled with because you were set apart before birth? Do you know that there are certain illnesses, adults, that couldn't even attack your body because you were set apart before birth? You, you were put to the side by your heavenly father. You look back over your life and you wonder why you couldn't get comfortable in certain environments because your comfort was blocked by your consecration. Certain things you never craved because your cravings were blocked by your consecration. Certain places you never had a desire to go because that desire was blocked by your consecration. There were certain people you never wanted to hang out with. It didn't matter how popular they were because that was blocked by your consecration. So there's your, there's an identification, there's sanctification, and then there's consecration. Say it with me, young people. Identification, identification. Sanctification, sanctification, and consecration. And the last thing we can get from the text is qualification. Look with me in verses 7 and 8. It says, but the Lord said to me, do not say I am too young. You must go to everyone I send you to and say whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them for I am with you and will rescue you, declares the Lord. Members of Holland Chapel, God is sending us to people and not places. The a success of our assignment for both the young and the old is not based on where we go, but to whom we are sent. 
the scripture reminds us that God will tell us where to go, who to talk to, and what to say when we get there. Young people, this can be scary to speak on behalf of God. I mean, I mean, after all, you've been taught that we're to reverence God and God speaks to us. But I need you to know from this morning's scripture that God will give you a word to say. And that can be very intimidating to think that little old you can hear a word from the Lord and then you speak it to someone else. But that's what God does all the time. When you say good morning to your parents, through you when you can say thank you ma'am and no sir that's God speaking to you when you can say I love you mama I love you daddy that's God speaking to you the scripture the scripture tells us to be careful and don't be afraid of them I, I, I got a little concerned here. It's like, Lord, now you and Jeremiah are having this conversation and you're telling him that he's been called and you're telling me that you could possibly send him to people that can make him fearful. Because sometimes when we talk to people and we tell them the truth, it will make them get upset. It will make them become angry. It will make them say things to you that are out of character for them. They, they will call you everything but a child of God. Not because there's something wrong with you, but the message that you're sending from God, they don't like it. But God says in the text, do not be afraid of them. Uh, Reverend Matthews, I struggled because I wanted the text to tell me who is them. Young people, it's them who will be more concerned about what you have on than what you have in your heart. It's them who will look at their watches before the first child even finish the litany this morning. It's them who will never have anything positive to say about you or the assignment that God has given you. Pastor Matthews will tell you, you can't find them when you need them. It's them who will do the least and say the most. You see, the devil works through them and his imps will use them. Every church has them. The Amen Corner is, has a small group of them. The pulpit can hold one or two of them. The pews are full of them. Uh, Every choir has them. Every auxiliary and board has a few of them. But we've been called to encourage them. We've been called to preach the gospel to them. The Bible tells me to bless them. That curse you and to feed them, Sister Moselle. Pray for them and to treat them right. It even says to clothe them and to serve them. And if you're concerned with how I know so much about them, because I used to be one of them, all I'm saying... All I'm saying is that God does not qualify the call. He does not call the qualified, but he will qualify those he called. So don't you be concerned about what God is telling you to do, where God is sending you to, because God is going to qualify you in his own way and in his own time. Let me tell this story and I'm going to take my seat because these young people done put us on a timeline like I ain't never seen before and I ain't about to mess it up. I think I shared with you all not too long ago how my mother, like most black women, had certain dishes that she just didn't pull out every day. Uh, she had dishes that stayed in the cabinet for an entire year until somebody special came along. I mean, I looked at them and I was like, well, this is such a waste of space. We don't do anything with these dishes until it's either Christmas, Thanksgiving, or Easter. We, we can just get rid of these. And my mama looked at me like I had lost my everlasting mind. She said, don't you touch 
my dishes because these are my special dishes and, and I know when to pull my special dishes out and, and, and that's what we did. But I started thinking about the dishes and, and I came across another story about a, a teacup that was being put on a shelf like my mama's dishes. And one day the lady went to look at the teacup that she had purchased and she said to the teacup, teacup you are absolutely beautiful. I, I, I just want you to sit here and allow me to look at you because you are beautiful and, and I appreciate that you've been set aside for, for something special. I don't know when that date will come but you sit right there until that day comes and, and on this particular day the teacup responded to the woman and said ma'am I appreciate that you like my beauty but can I tell you I hadn't always looked like this, you see. Ma'am, you don't understand. You didn't see me when I was the red clay down in South Carolina. And the master went down there and scooped me up. Ma'am, you didn't see me when the master took me and put me on a table and began to press on me and to pat me out and to roll on me. Ma'am, you didn't see me when the master began to shake me and mold me and I said master that's enough of that I can't take no more and the master said not yet ma'am you didn't see me when the master put me into an oven that was hotter than anything I've ever felt in my life I knew that I was about to take my last breath I remember banging on the oven door and all I could see was the master looking at me and saying not yet then the master took me out just in a nick of time. He put me back on the table and I thought, thank you, Lord. I'm about to get some much needed air. By the time I could think it, he began to paint me up and down all over me. The fumes were terrible. And before I could start to gag, he put me back in another oven that was twice as hot as the first oven. I said to myself, I will die this time for real because I can't take this kind of heat. I began bamming on the door again and all I could see was the master saying, not yet. And all of a sudden, before I took my last breath, the door of the oven opened and the Lord, my master, placed me on the table. He made me wait for an hour. But after one hour, he gave me a mirror. And I looked absolutely beautiful. I mean, I was downright gorgeous. And the master said to me, if I didn't take you through all of that, you wouldn't look the way you're looking today. So guess what? Young people, you've been set aside. You're simply gorgeous. Folks out there, you look gorgeous. But I got sense enough to know we didn't always look like this. A few of us have been through a few things. We've been in some hot situations. We've had paint all over us. But at the end of the day, God just wants us to know we've been consecrated. Because we were born for this. You can only go through what you're going through because you were born for this. You can only withstand what you've withstood because you were born for this. You can only deal with people like that and don't say nothing out of the way because you were born for this. And if you weren't born right the first time, many of us was born again and that's why we can do what we do. The doors of the church are open. As the choir begins to sing softly. Mm. Maybe you say, Broadwood, I don't know anything about this God you're talking about or his son Jesus. The altar is open. Today is the day on Youth Sunday when you can come. You're going to give the pastor your hand, but you're going to give God your heart. Maybe you say, well, Brad, when I, I knew it, I was raised in this church. My parents and my grandparents, I've sung in the choir as a young person. I've, I've ushered at the door with the young people. But life got between me and God. 
and you find yourself in a backslidden state, the altar is open so that you can reconnect with God your Father. Maybe you want to join, make this your church home. The altar is open for you to come at this time. We would love to have you. You may be seated. Young people, you can go ahead and give me another verse. Before we have our benediction, Pastor Matthews is going to come before us. I just want us to give God praise for that on-time word. Thank you. Thank you. And I appreciate that I got my lesson for this morning identification and sanctification, ordination and qualification. If nobody else got it, I got it. Amen, amen. amen. And I, I pray that them that heard amen. receive. Amen. 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 I started looking around at first and as she kept going down the list, I said, well, that sounds like me too. So we're all included, but um, I just thank God for you, uh, your ministry, your family, and we're just so appreciative of the anointing that God has given you to be in this ministry. We are fortunate, aren't we, Holland? We are very fortunate. We are very fortunate. Very fortunate. And with all, everyone, I'm not, I'm not privy of all who who helped with this event, but would you all stand? I know a few, but I don't want to miss anyone. Everyone that is an audience or here that helped out with this event. Come on, choir director. You, I saw you helping as well. Hey, Amen. Give a hand to all these. Amen. 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 Thank you so much. Y'all did a wonderful job. And I want the, all the youth that are here to stand so everyone can see you. All, all youth, all youth. Amen. If you're out there, give them a round of applause. Amen. So good to see all of you. And amen, amen. I want you to just, you know, take a moment. And as I'm just echoing what Reverend Roberts have said, that they have been set apart, and God has made them special and unique. And I want you to continue to invest in them and that's why I'm here because it's a lot to try to get them together and do these things transportation activities it takes a, a lot of investment so I'm asking you as I make the plea for our offering this morning that you set something aside and identify it on your envelope that it would be an investment for youth I want you know I, I grew up taking trips doing things and being involved in the church and we just I don't see that as much as anymore and so um, we want to make sure we have plenty of activities but we also want to make sure that the, the instructors have the materials and have all of the available resources that they need instead of asking them to go in their pockets I think we do well as a church that we can actually invest so I'm asking that you would do that please sow a seed into the youth. It will go into the youth department, materials, everything uh, that Reverend Roberts as director of youth would need. And so I'm asking you to do that this morning. Will you get your offering together? As you know that we 
We'll give our offering at the very end when you leave out. But if you need an envelope, please ask at this time. Raise your hand if you need an envelope. Amen. Let us, let us bow our heads. I, I know you're still getting together, but you, I'll give you time. But let us pray. Merciful and all wise God, I, we just thank you. We've come here to worship, and as the youth watch us emulate worship, God, we pray they also see that this is a sacrifice when we come before you, that we give gifts not of necessity, not out of grudgingly, not out of a deceitful heart. We give because you gave to us first. We give because there is cheerfulness in our heart. We give so that someone else might be blessed. I ask, Lord, that you'll take the gifts and the spirit of an intention for our youth that it will grow into an investment for our youth. I pray, God, our budget expands for our youth and that we have unlimited resources. We have so many of our members, God, will be want to be a part of the youth department. And I pray that as we see just a fraction of what we have to offer, Lord, that in the coming months, as we still continue to do our youth Sundays, that we'll see an explosion of youth, God, that, that it will be all from, from the choir, God, all in the sanctuary, in the overflow, God. I pray that we see youth ushers, God, and, and, every, and everyone that is in every position, that they will be a representative of youth. Teach us how to invest. Teach us how to do more. This is our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you for your gifts. Thank you for... Uh, the offering that you have provided this morning. Uh, was there any other comments, remarks from you, Sister Horton? Or Sister Lassiter, do you have anything else? I would like to um, recognize our missionary president and co-president, uh, Sister Brenda Thompson and Mrs. Genevieve Parker, and also like to thank all the um, buds and the, um, the youth for um, the service this morning. And I'd like to thank Sister Valerie Horton, for she was here on Friday night practicing with the children. And she did great. And, and, and we will do the missionary benediction. Ready now? Please remain seated as we end our worship service with the missionary benediction at the bottom of your programs. God be merciful unto us, and bless us, and cause his face to shine upon us, and give us peace. Amen. Amen. Let us give our young people a hand as we prepare to leave. Amen. doors that I cannot see. Jesus will, Jesus will, oh, who will make all my decisions for me? Jesus will.
me a song, me a song. And in the night season, in the night season, and all, and all the day long, the day long. And who makes me to rise? Who makes me to rise? When I, when I go to rock, Jesus. Jesus will. 